All right, you guys ready to get rolling again? Everybody's getting their coffee, their water. Do we need to bring the folks from the hallway back in? I think they actually bumped the AC up, so you might start warm defrosting a little bit. <laughs> You're welcome. Drink more coffee. Um, so I just want to remind you guys that at the end, this end of the tables are some surveys. If you haven't had a chance to fill one out, please do so. Uh, when you have a few moments, and you can hand those back to myself or Chris or Abby or Alicia. Or you can just leave them on the back table as well if you can't catch one of us. But um, we do appreciate your feedback. We want to um, grow this event, no pun intended, um, and make it even better for next year. So our last por uh, part of, our, of the summit today is our final keynote with Grayson Gill of Belgard Bakery. I'm really excited uh, that we were able to bring him in for this event because he's doing some really phenomenal things that are connecting local as well as national. And it's a really wonderful story. Um, as well, he, uh, one of my very good friends works for him, so it's always nice to meet your friend's boss. And uh, everything she said about him is true. <laughs> he's a really great guy, really easy to talk to. And um, so to further introduce you to Grace and Gill, we have a, a short video. So we're going to do put that on real quick. We say many things about the changing aspects of our lives. Since change is inevitable, we should direct the change instead of simply go through the change. At Belgard, we mill a percentage of the flour that goes into every single loaf of bread that we bake, and we're only working with organic grain. It's what's called identity preserved. So we don't do any sort of extraction here at the bakery. The flour is milled in between the two stones. It's shot out through this downspout, and it comes into a waiting bin, and we'll use that flour within four or five, six days, depending on how busy we are and how much volume we're going through when it comes to flour. I think uh, Grayson is one of very few in the South that are doing it at a level where we could actually begin to supply our restaurants with it on a regular basis. So this is a 100% um, rye flour that Grayson just milled, and it's it's still warm from the from the mill, which is really awesome to see. And it, it has so much aroma, and I can feel like the oils in it, and I can feel the moisture content in it. It's an introductory threshold to a bigger and better world when it comes to flavor and when it comes particularly to bread and to pasta is this fresh organic stone milled flour. The great thing about Grayson's bread is that you know when he bakes it, it has this beautiful crust. And it's one of those things that when you break into it, you can actually hear it crunch. And inside is so warm and so moist, um, which a lot of people don't execute very well. And he does it consistently and all the time. And that's, I think, one of the best features is having that nice crusty bread with that spongy inside that has this wheaty smell that it's almost nice and chewy. This is our flour mill. It's a 40-inch stone mill, and it was built in Vermont by my friend Andrew at Elmore Mountain Bread. The whole unit weighs about 2,500 pounds, and each stone is 40 inches in diameter and about six and a half inches thick. Terroir is the reality and also the conception that the nature of how something is grown is going to dictate how it tastes or how it is raised if it's a child. So when it comes to food and when it comes to ingredients, the, the context of that soil, the context of the farm that, that crop was grown on are all going to affect and dictate the quality or lack of quality of that product. So we're working really closely with growers to talk about the types of flavors that we want, the types of grain that we want, the type of strength and moisture and protein content. In our own little corner of the world, we're trying to reestablish that conversation with people and not hit them over the head with it, but at least introduce the fact to them that in the same way that they would approach an oyster, in the same way that they would approach a great bottle of wine, 
And in the same way that they would approach a glass of beer that's made by somebody who wants to be making that product, it's the same way that we want you to approach a loaf of bread that we make. I see the, you know, the evolution of food sourcing really heading back to um, levels of purity, really kind of going back to what is the story behind this ingredient and how can I bring out the best of this ingredient by doing less with it. You're tasting that rain irrigated organic wheat from the plains of Oklahoma. You're tasting that really moist, heirloom, soft, supple, creamy wheat from Wisconsin. You're tasting that pure rock salt from Avery Island, Louisiana. And my argument as a baker and as a miller and as a, a friend of chefs is to say, the ingredient's only gonna be dictated by the quality of the soil in which it was grown. And also it's only gonna be dictated on the quality of the process in which it was made. It's refreshing to see somebody that cares so much about from the beginning to the end, sourcing the grain to the final product and making sure it's consistent. They got it. They heard us without words, but with flavor. They heard what it is that we're trying to say with our bread. Grayson's making his way up to the podium. I just, any, you guys should all have a handout, a special handout. Looks like some legislation you might be interested in. Um, and after the presentation, we do have um, a networking happy hour. So you will want to find a board member and get your free drink ticket. Um, and then after that, it'll be an open cash bar. So, all right. How's everyone doing? Good. I um I did prepare a speech, which I guess I'm gonna guess I'm gonna go for. Um, and I definitely do want to kind of have questions or dialogue after afterwards. And we have a I don't have so much of a presentation going on, but just like looping the the slides if that's possible. Thank you. Yeah. So those can just loop. Um, and I did want to sincerely apologize for not being here yesterday and also not being able to stay pretty much after my presentation today, but the bakery that y'all saw in the video, we've been there for about seven years and we're moving literally today and yesterday and Sunday. So um, my girlfriend thought I had dandruff and it was just drywall that was been in my hair for like a week. And it's just been a long, long week, but we moved about 40,000 pounds of grain and flour and bakery equipment from one place to another. And we've only closed for 48 hours. So trying to do my best to kind of keep that, that momentum and that rhythm. But I do sincerely apologize for not being able to be here yesterday and for, for the whole day today. But it, it seemed like an incredible conference. And thanks to Jesse and to Jennifer for all the incredible work that they did. And thanks to y'all for, for coming too. Um, but I did want to just, again, extend my apologies for that. So we can, we can roll whenever you're ready. There's going to be just a bunch of photos of some of the stuff that we do and a few kind of different slides with some words about who we are and the kind of some stats about the bakery and about, about what we're doing at Belgard in New Orleans. But my, uh, my name is Grayson, and I own Belgard Bakery in New Orleans, and we're about six and a half, seven years old. And we're a commercial bakery, and we have a stone mill in New Orleans. We, uh, we make about 6,000 6, loaves of bread per week, and we mill about 3,000 pounds of flour each week for restaurants and supermarkets. So Rouse's, Robert's, Whole Foods, and then a litany of other restaurants um, in New Orleans, on the North Shore, and also in Baton Rouge. Um, my biggest goal since opening the bakery has been democratizing bread in terms of its ingredients, its flavor, and its nutrition. So really trying to open up what we do to as many people as possible, not just on an economic level per se, but everything that video spoke about. So how to make bread more accessible to more people, 
healthy bread, quality bread, nutritious bread? And I think that's a big question that I think they were hitting on on the previous panel, but the question of scale. How do you scale up integrity and how do you scale up quality? And that's something that I would like to circle back to later if anyone had any questions about that. But that's something that when I started baking 10 years ago, obviously it was on a very micro scale and I can appreciate the micro scale in terms of micro bakeries or micro producers, but I think that there's a bigger kind of generational shift happening that whether you're my age or older or younger, I think that we need to kind of start perforating the upper echelons of scale as opposed to staying kind of cute and neat, which is great, but in terms of really changing things, which is something I believe in wholeheartedly, we have to understand how we can scale up, but at the same time, there's a dual edge of integrity. But I think that you can scale integrity up as well too. So that's something that's always been important to me and I think continues to become more important to me as we grow. Um, so I'm here today to talk about, you know, values of local food, in my opinion, my kind of culinary journey with local foods and how I believe, you know, foods can be democratized in Louisiana. And that was a handout that we have, which we'll circle back to later, but I wrote that with a friend of mine two years ago. He's a representative from the West Bank of New Orleans. It's running for state Senate, but it was a local foods resolution, not a law, of course, but um, just a resolution about some kind of guiding values that we have about local foods and about organic foods as well, too. And I thought John's presentation was incredible um, on policy. So there's nothing that I really want to overlap any more than what he spoke about, because that was an awesome presentation. Um, and then definitely, I think it's really important to open up the floor after I talk for a little bit, just for questions and for dialogue. I think it's really important that we have conversations that aren't just polite all the time, but challenging people and I think encouraging people and most importantly, I think when you're challenged or when you're encouraged and hopefully you change your opinion, that's how you're gonna help other people change as well too. But a big thing that I've seen since being in the food business, so to speak, is that a lot of people are not willing to be vulnerable to change who they are, or what they think or how they feel. And I think that really restricts our potential, not just as individuals, but as a group. And I think that's all practice and that's all gonna be carried out through dialogue and through having conversations or asking pointed questions about how you can get into a restaurant, whether that's a literal example that someone can provide or whether it's just something, a suggestion. But I think having these conversations are really important. So whether it's a conversation about maybe how privileged it is to have and to afford local food or whatever it may be, I think it's just really important that we have dialogue that can kind of walk us out of the woods that we've been led into with pretty bad food and pretty bad ingredients. So like many people, my culinary journey began as a child. It quickly focused to a sharp edge when I arrived in New Orleans at age 21. I found bread and bread found me. I started baking for no particular reason and haven't stopped for 10 years. And though I've spent every waking moment since age 21 thinking about bread, it wasn't until recently that I seriously thought about its ingredients. I was trained how to make hundreds of baked goods, but I was never trained how to taste food. I was never trained how to understand ingredients. I was trained to make bread, but not to understand flour. As I baked more and more in bakeries and restaurants and at vocational baking school, my culinary journey became more of a layover, a trip. I saw places and saw new things, new recipes and new techniques, but I never went towards the origin of bread, its main ingredient, which is flour. I never made that journey until I saw my first stone mill. And that was some of the photos that you guys saw earlier, especially in the video, was that huge round piece of granite. So obviously I'm pretty focused on my passion, which is bread and which is flour milling. But the main ingredient for those that don't know in, in, in bread and pasta and cookies and muffins and anything that's baked is going to be flour. And then, of course, there's water and there's salt. And when I went to baking school and as I worked in bakeries and in restaurants, as I mentioned, there was everything about the recipe would change. You would, you would have different kinds of sugars or different kinds of vegetables or different kinds of oil or butter or spices, but the main ingredient was always this white flour. And I began to question if that was the one common theme in all of these recipes, why don't we have different flavors of that, so to speak? And as I kind of went down that rabbit hole, I just realized that there was no one making the flour that I wanted to bake with. And that in turn made me buy my own 2,500 pound flour mill in the middle of New Orleans, which is a completely different conference and story that probably would be better with alcohol involved because 
as I was talking to Grant in the back, we're milling, now we're milling about 3,000 pounds of flour a week in downtown New Orleans. And we're sourcing all that grain directly from the farmers. So logistically, it's a gigantic nightmare. And it's obviously something that we're very passionate about. Otherwise, we wouldn't want to be doing it. But I'm sure that you guys have all heard of chefs that have their own little herb gardens, or maybe they're working with farmers to work on certain produce or whatever it is. But it was the same kind of trajectory for us, is that we didn't have the ingredient that we wanted to work with. So we kind of got pushed or pushed ourselves into a corner where we can make it ourselves. And yesterday I set up our new flour mill. So we have another 40 inch flour mill at the new bakery and we'll be doubling how much flour we're milling and that we're using as well too because it, it just goes back to whether you're a, a musician or a painter or a chef or a farmer, when you have an intimacy and when you have a passion for something, I mean, maybe some of us sell out or maybe some of us get a little bit diluted or frustrated now and again in our passions, but you always stay that course. And for me with the flour, it's always gonna be on that course. I'm never gonna be able to walk away from that. So just buying a bag of flour from the store and opening it up with no terroir, no integrity, no identity, no aroma, no texture, no story, is something that I would never wanna do again. And hence we go through this gigantic amount of logistics and problems and meeting farmers to buy grain from, but it's all about what we do and it's all about our ingredients, which is all about the story that we tell about ourselves and about our food. Um, so as I said, we're, we're milling about 3,000 pounds of flour a week right now, and that's, that's gonna be doubling uh, starting next week, and we use about 80% of that, and then we also sell quite a bit of it to uh, different restaurants and different bakeries in New Orleans as well too. So we work with about eight different grains. We have a durum, an heirloom rye, a durum from Texas, an heirloom rye from Texas as well. We have an heirloom corn from a little bit south of Mobile that's been grown by the same family since 1875. And then we buy wheat from Kansas and also from Oklahoma. And I was speaking to Grant a few minutes ago, but if anyone's interested in that kind of part of the story, that took about 10 years of just relationships of basically calling every single ag school in the Gulf South and the Deep South to talk about their small grains program. So there's no Craigslist for hey, I, I want 2,000 pounds of wheat, you know, can you help me out? There's, there's no clearinghouse. And I think, it, Zach, you were speaking about the technology earlier to this panel about having some sort of, I think it's important to have some sort of clearinghouse about what people want and what people have. And that's, I think, a bigger part of the conversation about scale is infrastructure. And how can we scale up if we lack the infrastructure? But with technology, we allow so much potential for scale to occur because if you can hook somebody up that has 30 pounds of tomatoes or 10,000 pounds of you know, corn or whatever, and we have the ability to take that, I think that gives us a lot more leverage than somebody like General Mills or, or Kraft Foods that can't move as quickly as a smaller food producer like we can. So we occupy a really distinct kind of place in the market where I buy maybe like 3,000, 300,000 pounds of, of grain a year which to maybe like lay people, that seems a lot, but when you talk to a grain farmer, even an organic grain farmer, that's, that's nothing. Like a lot of these men and women are doing us the favor to sell to us because the packaging and the infrastructure and the transport to get their stuff to us is a lot more time consuming and expensive than it would be for them to sell their entire lot to you know, a huge flour mill. So I think once again, the theme from the few sessions that I've sat on in today is about relationships. And it's about the relationship and about the integrity, I think, that you have behind who you are and behind what you do. And I think that's really the, the phrase about cream rising to the top. I think that if you really pursue your passion, I think with an integrity and not an arrogance, but with a passion about loving what you do, people are gonna see that. And Allison mentioned that at the, about the farmer's market. And I have a whole nother, you know, experience and thoughts about farmer's markets and how I think mismanaged they are about having two, two types of this cookie cutter and two types of that vendor and two types of these other vendors. But in reality, I think the passion is gonna come through at the end of the day, no matter what. And you're gonna find the right people, I think at the right point in your life when you need them most, whether that's a customer or an employee or whatever it may be. So people that are just starting out, like we've all been there and there's no other way that you would wanna do it. And it's just like any relationship. If you don't make a mistake, you're never gonna get better at it. And that's something that's been really important for us in terms of um, going through everything, whether it's not getting paid or 
uh, getting shorted or not having people show up or whatever it may be, if, if the passion is always there, you're always going to go back to doing what you love. And that's, that's the biggest thing, I think, to kind of stay on point with. And that's always been a guiding value of, of what we do at the bakery. And I would say the last thing kind of before wrapping up and maybe opening up to questions or, or anything else was, is piggybacking on that, that the integrity of what we do is something that I, I want to see manifested in our ingredients. Meaning I didn't want to just open a bakery and buy this from this place or this from this distributor and get this stuff from Cisco. And then people would say, oh, it's, it's great bread and it's made in New Orleans and it's local. There would be nothing local about that. Maybe I'm paying local taxes and maybe my, my mailing address is in New Orleans, but what impact do I have upon ecology or even the economy if nothing that I'm doing is from our state? And granted, I'm a baker, so there's really not a lot of wheat that I can buy in Louisiana. Um, but in terms of thinking deeper, the integrity behind an ingredient. It took me five years to get a hold of Avery Island salt in Avery Island, but that's the only salt that we use in our bakery. So it's coming right from the salt mine. The same with our olive oil. It's coming right from San Antonio in Texas. It's one variety that's grown and pressed and shipped by the same family. And the same with the majority of our grains. The only people in between our producers and what they make and our bakery is the people driving the truck to bring it to us. And I think it's really important that the integrity, once again, not only of that relationship with the producer, but with the ingredient is really going to manifest who you are and what you stand for. And I know that's why I love what I do, and I know that's why we have people work at our bakery, because they understand the commitment that I have and that we have, not to money. I mean, of course, you have to be solvent and you have to be profitable, but at the end of the day, I think it goes back to that passion. And if that passion is integrity, I think that's really going to shine through at the end of the day. And that's the most important thing for us is how can we do it more and more and more and make people understand. And probably the last place they would think in the world you could have like a seed to soil bakery or whatever you want to call it, the, the trend of farm to table applied to a commercial bakery in New Orleans, you would think that that would never be feasible. And I've had more people than I need to remember to tell me that it would never work and that it's terrible and I'm stupid and all of these excuses about what I wanted to do and still to this day having those responses but yet sticking to that passion and how buoyant that can make you feel has always been really important for us too. And then digging deeper and deeper and deeper to realize how important it is not just for the ecology of our state but I think also for the economy of our state to investigate what local ingredients can do and what they should do for, for Louisiana. And I think it was the previous, I forget who the speaker was, but somebody hit on something on the previous panel, but you, you can't, a, a friend of mine in South Carolina has a great phrase and he says that you, you can't have a cuisine without ingredients. So I know that we may have, um, you guys are having your gumbo or etouffee out in Cadiana, but I would argue that if those, if those dishes aren't made with local ingredients, I would almost argue maybe they aren't those dishes. Because if you're making that with Malaysian shrimp, or maybe you're using corn grits from Idaho that are GMO, or you're using uh, boudin with Carolina pork, or you're baking bread with flour from God knows where, is it, is it really inherently that food anymore? Because the cuisine is really created on the ingredients that are available to it. That's really important that there's a context, not only of people, of Africans and, and Europeans and Native Americans that made the cuisine of Louisiana, but the ingredients that we had that were either indigenous to this place or the people brought here. But we're getting farther and farther away from those seeds. And I think it's really important, again, to retain that integrity of the cuisine by kind of repatriating those ingredients back to where we live. And I think a lot of us in this room, especially probably Allison and I, and probably Grant in particular, we care more about the ecology side of things, but I think it's really important and it's something I try to do with this resolution is making the economy part of that equation make sense. Because we spend so much money on food in Louisiana and if only we could have politicians in LSU recognize the potential value of growing some of that food in state and encouraging some of that food to be grown in state, it's gigantic. And I think that all we're asking for is not the whole river, but just a little tributary. Just maybe 10%, like the church, just a little tithe. Just taking, <laughs> taking, taking a little bit. Give us a little bit of organic research. Give us a little bit of funding. Give us some trial. Give us some plots. Give us something else, except for this one monochromatic answer of this is how it's done. 
And that's something that I think we need to agitate for more and more and more because I'm 31, I'm a millennial, and we're growing generational, we're a growing generation that's changing things. And I don't think that politicians in Baton Rouge, and I've, I've met Mike Strain, the commissioner for ag, and he's a nice enough guy. I, I would have a beer with him if I needed to, but we don't have anything in common. We really don't. I mean, maybe we, we both are Catholic and it probably stops there. But I think when I can get somebody like him to understand the economic value of local ecology-based foods like we're talking about today, that's going to be the middle ground. And I think that's the argument that hopefully all of us can make, whether that's verbal or whether that's you know, leading by example with, with what we do and with, with how, we, how we make things. But that's something that's very important to me is, once again, the scale and this notion of scale is just because it's beautiful or just because it's, it's boutique or whatever it is, that doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. So how can we get the help to scale that up and to retain that integrity, but also to tell our stories through our ingredients? And I think that's the most important thing is that food is a story. And I think that ingredients are definitely going to be the alphabet of that story. And a place as special as Louisiana, I think it's really imperative that we, we retain our stories by being able to tell them ourselves. And I think we can only do that if we keep our ingredients, whether they're local or regional, but having some sort of integrity behind them is going to retain who we are and what we do and to allow those stories to continue to be told. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions or, I mean, anything about our, our business at the bakery or anything that y'all are going through, whatever it may be, but just wanted to open up the floor and I see people running for the, Running for the mic. I like the Oprah line. That was great. <laughs> All right. So uh, we just actually we do a viewing at Vermillionville, and we showed the uh, Symphony of Soil. I don't know if you guys are familiar with no. that uh, video. It's a documentary. And it's just a beautiful documentary explaining the importance of how long soil takes to be created and the importance of organic farming and how organic farming not only helps to mitigate uh, water quality, but also recharge of our aquifers. So organic farming is definitely a tremendous solution to a lot of issues we have dealing with water quality. So with that, I was wondering, if there's a report that was actually produced on February 1st, 2018, that we could actually review. Say it again? The, in the resolution that was passed, it oh, says... They've, they've, no, they've done, nothing's been done about that, okay, unfortunately. Well, I was just wondering, because I would definitely be interested. Absolutely. In, uh, and that's, that's, that's a big thing that I, I think about a lot as well, too. I mean, you brought up two points. I would say that maybe the most important one I'd like to touch on now would be what you said about water quality, which I, 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 I see things kind of as a binary in the sense of like there's short term stuff and there's long term stuff. And like despite your opinion about chemical inputs in agriculture, it's definitely a short term solution. And there's like there's a saying amongst Native Americans that you're never speaking for yourself, but you're speaking for seven generations ahead of you. And I think organic ag, no, no matter your ethical opinion about it, we're going to be paying if we're not paying already for the cost ecologically, economically, infrastructure-wise, climate-wise, weather-wise, for chemical agriculture and for driving cars and other things too. But we're paying for that now, and I think that's got to be the tweak in a public policy kind of mind is to realize, and once again, going to Mike Strain to talk about like a kumbaya, green party, like, you know, all this nice, warm, fuzzy environmental stuff, like not going to work. But I think when somebody like that is made to understand that the quality of the water is going to affect the petroleum industry. It's going to affect all sorts of farmers in 20 years. So we can either mitigate that when the, you know, what hits the fan, or we can start working and mitigating that right now through methods of organic agriculture. And I think that's something really important too that we fail to, we fail to talk about because too often we become so ensconced in our own language and our own friends and our own Facebook groups that we never get out to meet new people or different people and therefore it just becomes a loop of talking the same way and saying the same things and going into these traps of the short term. And I think that's a really important point that you brought up, that it's the water quality is one of the biggest things and it's one of the biggest assets that we have. And if we don't pay for that or, or if we don't pay attention to that now, we're going to be paying for it later. 
And that's what nobody's talked about with coastal restoration. I mean, it's great that they're doing what they can and they're spending God knows how much money, but nobody's asking why that happened. Why did that happen? And why are we doing this? Why do you have a hangover? Because I drank too much the night before. It's like, well, what happened on the coast? We're paying to solve a problem and we're confusing the symptom for the disease. And that's, that's happening in many, many ways, I think, um, you know, with racism and with the food that we eat and with how we grow food and education and, you know, prisons and all of these things. But it's, it's, it's not drawing a line between the short term and the long term. And I, I, I feel like that's a connection that needs to be made for politicians on the policy level. But the, the, the way that it's talked about, I think we have to be very conscientious not to isolate or upset people that probably, I'm sure that Mike, would, Mike Strain would agree with a lot of things that we would talk about here today, but the way that you say that, I think we need to be conscientious about those things as opposed to being so uh, binary or so um, just very, uh, yeah, you understand what I'm saying. I was wondering if you could talk about like what your first year of Belgard Bakery was like, and then how did you scale up to where you are now? Um, I didn't. I dropped out of university, so I never really went to you know school for business or anything. I got a um, I got an eighty thousand dollar loan from the SBA or from something like the SBA um, to open the bakery. I uh, I bought a bunch of used like trashy equipment that I fixed and drywall and you know all that fuse boxes and kind of cleaned everything up so and then uh, as I was talking to Grant as well earlier too we just got a very simple building so I didn't go I don't know how many people here are familiar with New Orleans but we definitely didn't open on Magazine Street where <laughs> the rent would have crushed me and I would have been scared um, into doing things that I didn't want to do to cover my overhead so uh, if you can't tell, I like to do things on my own terms, um, and I'm willing to make sacrifices in order to achieve that. So the first year, I mean, it was beautiful, but it was also hell and tragic and difficult. But the scaling up was just keep going and going and going. But as far as like literal stuff that we did, like there was no, I mean, I did sales calls in the very beginning, but there was no like sales calls. Um, there was no marketing or, or advertising in the Gambit or the Picayune or anything like that. It was just basically word of mouth. Um, and because New Orleans is a small town, I think a lot of people I've noticed, if they leave a kitchen and go to another kitchen, they typically bring us with them. Uh, and then also I have some really great friends like Alan and Nina who have always been supportive. I mean, they don't cut me slack, but I think they vindicate me and they've been friends for, you know, not since the beginning, but having friends like that I think has given us some more traction as well too but yeah the first year I mean I think I was so delirious with wanting to get it done that I didn't really focus on how hard it was I think really there's no formula but I would say probably the third or fourth year of my business was that was brutal and like that was that was the hardest part because the first the first year is so many endorphins and adrenaline about getting it up and running and still figuring it out but it's really that third and fourth year where things are not quite firm and you're not quite solvent, but you gotta get over that hill. And I guess I've, I've heard that like the fifth year is like the magic number where like, unless you really F it up, like you'll, you'll probably be okay. Um, but as far as the literal level, like it just goes back to that passion. It goes back to that. So matter, no matter how hard the day may have been or how bad the week was or how many people didn't pay you, if, if, if I was still able to wake up and fall in love with bread every morning, it's not that it didn't matter, but it, it, it kind of diluted that, that stuff. And that definitely started with the first year. And it was just a hard lesson to be able to really focus and maintain that passion. But I think without having that, of course, things would have evaporated too. And I think the other thing too that I haven't spoken about yet is I think the difference between like, I, I always like to say I set up the, the bakery was a bakery, it wasn't a business. And I kind of see those as being separate things. It may be a little bit, um, not egotistical, but like just thinking that the bread is what I love doing and it's just a bakery and like money is kind of the second thing to it. Like I still kind of look at it that way because of course it's a business and like I have huge liability insurances and I have vans and employees and workers comp and all sorts of stuff. But it's still, again, it's about that passion. And I think if I was worried about making rent or making money or paying back the loan or like all these things, that wasn't my goal in the first place. My goal was to bake, and that's still my goal today. And I think just retaining that integrity and, once again, that passion is the only thing that kept me solvent. And I think 
as I left my crew to come here today and they're dealing with 20,000 tradesmen and different oven connections and Entergy and everything else, I know that it's the passion knowing that they'll be able to bake bread tomorrow, which is making this terrible week just like <laughs> go away. I have to think that because otherwise like I would feel terrible for them. But I, um, I mean, that's why we're all there. That's why, that's why, that's why we all are here for food. That's, I mean, let's face it, like food is delicious, but it's a way of life and we're not here for the money. This is not Shark Tank. We're here because we love food and like, yeah, everybody has needs, material needs, and everybody has different levels of material needs and desires, but at the end of the day, we do this because we love it. And I think if you lose sight of that, then you, you probably should find the exit because it's, it's not the business to be in to make money. I think definitely to earn money and to make enough, but if that's your motivation, I, I think this is the wrong conference room. I know the Sandals Convention is, <laughs> is that three, three doors down. But. Anything else? Oh. Yeah. So here's my thing. I totally support organic. Mm -hmm. We've already agreed we don't have enough farmers in Louisiana. There's a truck farm they've been farming for 20 years. Uh -huh. um, every year they don't know if they're going to be farming next year. Do we totally snub these farmers because they're not organic? No, Do I we support all of our farmers? I mean, because my product, we, my husband and I have a community feel. We work, we want to work with the farmers. We want to build the relationships. Right. Livestock, everybody. Right. We're not going to snub someone because they're not totally organic because they're feeding their family from that field. No, if it's a, so, like, but I feel like, sorry. I told you some agree. other companies mm -hmm. snub these farmers because they're not organic, and right. so they feel their product is superior mm -hmm. than possibly mine, or I'm not doing the same process. I feel we're all in the game together. Right. We have to support each other because if locals are fighting locals, how the hell are we going to make it? Right. And so it, that's the hard part uh -huh. is being a communal, local community right. where it's not I'm on top of you, I'm better than you. We're a community, we're working together, mm -hmm. and we're going to make a difference because we want to work with all the farmers and we look at more small farms than commercial farms because they're the ones we need right commercial farms they have their money they have their customers small farms are the ones that's struggling mm -hmm. so i would say i mean once again like in the words of the church it's hate this you know hate the sin but love the sinner and it's like i don't we we don't use everything organic in our bakery because once again even in new orleans like People don't really care about organic. They care about how the food tastes. I think on an ecological level, I care deeply about organic, but they have to be pragmatic. And I think the best thing to do is hopefully just to talk to those people, to be like, what kind of path can we get you on to be organic in five years? And that's the other problem. That's the other huge disconnect. I mean, this room has been great so far, but there's a huge, and that's, a, that's an issue I have with that New Orleans of food policy people. It's like, they're nice people, but they have no idea what we go through. And there's so many urban people that don't have a, a clue. We were talking at lunch today about somebody trying to go pet a cow at Max's farm. It's like, I mean, it's, I mean, I know that we want to touch animals and everything, but like there's a huge disconnect, not only literally, but I think expectation wise between urban people and people that live in the country or people that work with food. And I think that again, like we should be the people that are telling our own stories. And that's something really, really important. And approaching your community, I think, in a spirit of you know, collaboration and not competition is something that's imperative for you guys to grow together and for everybody to be vulnerable and to have conversations about, we care about organic. I know that you're not on that path, but how can we meet in the middle? Maybe you can not use an herbicide and, and then we'll, we'll take it and it's good to go. And maybe in three years, we can work with the Ag, the ag Extension Officer to address how to not use anything, not any inputs at all. And there's a middle ground, but I would never spurn someone that's doing the right thing just because it doesn't fit my bill of sale. I think that's really immature and really irresponsible. And we don't live in a place where you can do that. Cause there's like, if, if you're gonna say goodbye to Jerry, then like Meredith next door is, I mean, there's, there's, there's nobody available for that. So I think that you just have to be frank with people 
uh, you don't need to be disrespectful, but having frank conversations about what, what can I do to help you? That's, that's all, I mean, once again, it's, y'all, y'all seem to be a couple. I mean, everybody, we all go through this, and like, that's how, that's how you get through something, but if your sincere desire is to have that, that collaboration, then you have to be vulnerable to have these conversations about what can I do, and this is also what I, I feel like I need you to do, too. Um, but there are, there are things at our bakery that we don't use that are, orga- that are not organic, and that's just because it's financial and it's also location, it's context. And it's not a perfect world, but we don't live in a perfect world. So I think being pragmatic, and hopefully it's not something that um, we talked about much today that I saw, but the Ag Extension Office and LSU and Southern, that's a whole other conference, I think, too, and how corrupt and messed up that whole situation is. But I think holding those people accountable to answer questions about how can I grow these things organically? And I've had the door shut on my face at LSU for 10 years. They don't, they don't care, but I mean, I think that's illegal and I don't think that's fair. And I think they have, they're, they're public employees at the university and they should be able to answer these questions and we shouldn't expect to have an answer overnight because it's agriculture, it takes time. But I think holding these people more accountable to address the needs of the whole community is what their role as public servants is about. And I think holding those people more accountable to the things that, that we want to see, whether that's a, a organic non-GMO rice or organic habaneros or whatever it may be, that's, that's their job. We shouldn't all have to be public breeders and you know, tinkerers and doing all of our own stuff. Like We have a pretty incredible university system all throughout the country and all throughout the state that has the infrastructure, some of the funding, and all of the training to perform all these tasks. And I think it's some sort of pressure group to apply pressure on these people to actually do their job. It's really important for us to move forward. I think not just you know in Acadiana, but also in the entire state. Because it's one thing for me to go to the wheat breeder at LSU, my little self, and say, I really want this. And it's like, OK. But if he gets 30 calls from one person, or if, if 20 people go to Mike Strain's office, or we have a petition of 1,000 chefs and business leaders in Louisiana to say, stop growing stuff for Monsanto and Syngenta and give us that 10% of organic this research, that's going to change. But it goes back to what you said. If that's not a community effort, it's just one voice and it's one pebble that's dropped in the ocean and no one's going to listen. No one's going to listen. And why should they? Why should they? But when a lot of people get together with a common cause and that spirit of collaboration, then I think that's when, that's when the waves are made. Does that answer your question? I have a simple question. Uh, I just Googled you. I have looks, no simple answers. It uh, looks up. like you're on uh, Teledonna. We're, that's where we're moving from. Okay, where yeah. are you moving to? To Claiborne and Carrollton. So not, okay. not very far away. Okay, so, and you have a retail out, uh, shop? We're, we've never been retail, so we've been oh. open almost seven years without any retail. And at the new bakery, we're going to have retail in okay. about a month. I just wanted to visit you. Yeah, and then good. also, um, uh, how much uh, red, hard red spring wheat do you use? We get that from Oklahoma, and we're doing maybe. It's probably a hard red winter wheat. I'm sure it's winter wheat. The spring wheat no, uh, is north of the, yeah, the yeah, Missouri, uh, from uh, uh, northern uh, Montana and Canada. Maybe 120,000 to 150, 150,000 pounds of hard red winter wheat. Well, I can you help you if you need uh, red, hard red uh, spring wheat. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Making connections. Any other questions? All right. Uh, really enjoyed hearing about you guys. I've uh, had customers that are just huge fans of yours. But um, I was wondering if you could talk. You mentioned, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, uh, basically the flavor of the land. The terroir. You, yes. Can you, can, you, can you mention about, you know, what, what is that? Why does it matter? Ter- terroir is a concept, um, basically, I mean, it's French, like all, all good things are. Um, it's a concept from winemaking, and even from before winemaking, from basically from farmers, that uh, a place has a context, a place has a thumbprint, a place has an identity. And when I'm saying a place, I'm saying like that hill on Pinhook, where you grow that kind of corn, that's very different than the corn that's grown on that, that hill on um, West University, you understand? And these are very different things. And the amount of sunlight that that gets versus the amount of rainfall that that gets versus like how much did you cut that corn and how much did you let that corn go wild? Did you polycrop that corn with squash or is that just tomatoes and corn over there? 
every, it's just like a child. Like, what, what was your childhood like? Like, what went into the jar of your childhood? And then you grew up out of that jar and became a person. Terroir is the same concept, and everything has it. Everything has it. I would argue that, like, GMO rice and Crowley does not have it, and I would argue that there's not GMO wheat, but, like, a mono, mono, mono crop of wheat in Texas does not have that. I mean, I'm sure that you could say that on principle it does, but I don't, I don't believe that it does. I don't believe, believe that it's limited to, like, a tomato plant in the windowsill, and, like, that's a special terroir. I think an entire farm, and indeed in France and Spain and Italy and other wine growing areas, entire farms and villages have a very specific terroir, but it's all about the conjunction and the synchronicity of sunlight, rainfall, slope, elevation, drainage, soil type, uh, uh, seed type. What did you do as a farmer? All of these things, and they, they impact a person in the same way they impact a plant. And can you really break out to say and to tell me like, well that corn on, on pinhook is like more fruity, it's like, I don't really care about that because like we all have our personal taste preferences. So when it comes to terroir, I'm not trying to break it down that much. I mean, of course I want to taste something, but I'm, I'm more concerned again about that story and not just to sell the story, but again, to have that intimacy and the story reinforces the integrity. If someone can't tell you a story, I don't know if they have integrity, especially if they're trying to sell you something, whether that's a tomato or whether that's wheat or whether that's a music or a painting. If there's nothing behind it, if it's not any three-dimensionality to it, I wouldn't trust it. And to me, that's the, the, the language for that is going to be terroir. So I know about my farmer's soil. I know about their growing practices. I know about their irrigation. We don't buy any irrigated stuff. Um, every, every, when did you harvest? What was the, the first question in May, for my, or in May and June for my farmers is what, what was harvest like? Or I'll check the weather in Oklahoma to see if they're getting rain because I'll know that more rain at the time of harvest is going to affect this, this, and this. Not just flavor, but also behaviors for baking and for milling. So everything is affected by terroir. But then again, that becomes like the monoculture of Syngenta and Monsanto is like, I can toss these seeds on West University and Pinhook, and you spray it once a day and walk away, and you're going to have corn. And it's like, well, corn's just a four-letter word. It's like, well, what else we got? You know, like, what am I working with? And that goes back again to about the cuisine being a story that's kind of illustrated by ingredients. And if we don't have those ingredients, we're not going to have that cuisine anymore. And for me, that's a concept of terroir, is, is understanding everything that goes into something, and that's what you're getting out of it. Yesterday, on the bus tour, when we stopped at Brookshire Farm, they, they, they didn't use the word terroir, but they were essentially talking about yeah. that and when they talked about their grass-fed uh, cattle and how they moved them around and how they, mm -hmm. they knew what, their gra what grasses they had and what the soil was like. Um, so it's all coming back. Uh, you know, it's, it's all very tied together. Right. So um, thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? Max? I don't even need the microphone. Um, nothing really, are, have you read, it, it sounds like you're well read. I, I'd like to know what books have, have been like an influence in your life. Because um, I know that was a big part of, of me getting to all, all these concepts that, you know, the word integrity is, um, is, is very important to uh -huh. me. Um, you, you know, there, I can point to a Wendell Berry book and, yeah. and say like that, that one changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. Um, is there anything you read recently or a long time ago? What, what books would I don't, you uh, give I some don't, credit to? I don't read too much anymore. I, I love Winona LaDuke. Um, she's, a, she's a Native American and she lives in South Dakota and she ran on the Green Party ticket in 96. Um, and she's a political activist and also, she's not a farmer per se, but obviously like in favor of land rights and other kind of indigenous rights and things like that too. So I don't necessarily follow her for those reasons because we don't have anything in common when it comes to that. But as far as her, uh, her wisdom is really attractive and very beautiful. And I think um, I just, I, I think the way that I was raised kind of, uh, I was raised by basically by like women that left Europe after World War II, like Western Europe. So like. The, this like ethical Catholic, like right and wrong, like it's very, it's very strong in me about like right and wrong. And that doesn't mean that like I don't err and that I don't make mistakes, but integrity and, and working hard and being honest and doing the best job that you can do because 
that's that's life. Like you're not having any handouts and you're not given anything. And that's I don't know any I don't know any different. Like I don't I don't know any different. So as far as um, as as far as like having time recently, it's it's been it's been kind of tough. But I I I know Wendell Berry kind of um, not personally per se in terms of having read a lot of this stuff, but obviously I think is a huge a huge influence and. Um, there's a beautiful writer named Wallace Stegner who wrote the book for the, that George Clooney movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He wrote that book that they made that movie on and he's an incredible writer. He was kind of based out in the West in like the 30s, 40s, and 50s and he's, he's a wonderful writer too and his kind of view of ecology. And I don't know if you know Aldo Leopold who was kind of like maybe like a, a godfather to Rachel Carson in a way who also is incredible. Um, and I'm not just reading these people or enjoying them for their ecological standpoint, but I think just their wisdom. And I think it goes back to not wanting to, you know, I come from like divorced parents, so I never want to upset anybody because I saw people upset all the time. So finding a middle ground between people is kind of my goal, and I think that's the only way to move forward. So I may like Rachel Carson a lot, but that doesn't mean that we have to shove organic down everybody's mouth because that's maybe not pragmatic in Opelousas, or maybe it's not pragmatic in... I mean, it works in Santa Monica, California, but it doesn't work everywhere. But other things like that can work in plenty of other places. And I think the most important thing, especially in this part of the South, that I didn't talk about is that we have precedent. Everything that we're talking about at this conference, local food, organic food, local ingredients, saving your own seed, farmer's markets, direct markets, there's 300 years of precedent for that in Louisiana. And I think we have to make the distinction that like corporate ag, uh, ag with um, artificial inputs. This is the new thing. What we're talking about, local food, regional food, food hubs, direct markets, this is originally how our grandparents and everybody before them lived, ate, and worked. What we're dealing with now is the new kid on the block. And they're the ones that have to explain themselves. I don't think that we have to explain who we are and ourselves and what we're doing because we're just asking for things to kind of go back to where they were. I don't think that we need to live by candlelight and you know walk to work every day, but still, like taking the concepts of the past with the technology that we have available to us today is a really good way forward. And I think it's important to once again kind of use language to frame things in a way that is is understandable to people, but also relatable, because there is a lot of privilege, unfortunately, with eating local food or or going to Whole Foods. So how can you? It's it's a goal of mine to try to tear that down a little bit too. And I think it's really important to meet people in the middle not on terms that they understand, but in a place where we can work together to talk about everybody giving something in order for everybody to get a little something back. So. That's great, Grayson. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you Thank so you much. much. Thank all of you.